Hello, and welcome to part two of our series of lectures on the digestive system. And in part two, we're going to take a look at the oral cavity and the esophagus. And so when we take a look at the oral cavity, one of the first structures we're going to take a look at are going to be the teeth. And so again, with the teeth, what we're focusing in on is a structure that's going to be involved with the mechanical breakdown of the food particle particles. So we're essentially going to be bringing in a large uh, kind of bolus of food, a large clump of food, and then breaking it down. And breaking it down mechanically is going to do a couple things. It's going to grind it up. It's going to break a large food particle up into a bunch of smaller food particles. And it's going to promote the, the mixing of the food with the saliva, the mixing of the materials are going to be involved with the start of the chemical breakdown. And so if we take a look at teeth, we need something that's going to be very strong and essentially, in essence, going to allow us to essentially subject to a lot of abrasion, a lot of use, and ideally something that's going to be a whole lot harder than the food that we're going to be bringing in. And we're basically going to ground the food particles up uh, like we'd be using like a mortar and pestle uh, outside, of, uh, outside of the mouth. And so if we take a look at the tooth, uh, what we want is an external covering that is going to be incredibly hard. And we're going to have that with the enamel of the tooth. The enamel is going to be the hardest component within the, the human body. And it's very similar to what we see within bone, uh, but it's even harder than bone. It's upwards of about 95% of the calcium phosphate crystals. And so we've got this very, very hard covering on the outer surface of the teeth. Uh, but keep in mind that with this very, very hard surface, subject to a lot of abrasion, because we're, we're chewing on food, we're grinding you know, our teeth, we're grinding materials, we're not going to have cells that are going to be able to be surviving along the outer surface of this. And so we need to keep that in mind because the cells that are involved with producing the animal during development, we'll talk about that in a couple slides, can't be maintained. And so the enamel that's present when the tooth erupts uh, is going to be all the enamel that's going to be produced biologically. Uh, so it's not possible to continue to produce a replacement for this enamel. And again, because of the hardness of this structure, uh, it's not normally going to be present in histological sections. It's going to be uh, essentially uh, dissolved away uh, in the processing of the teeth. Now, underlying the enamel is going to be dentin. Dentin is a calcified material, which is very, very similar to bone. So it's got a lot of strength to the structure, similar to what we'd have with the bone structure. And what we're going to see within this are the support of the dentin, essentially the support of these bone cells, is going to be with cells that are uh, odontoblasts or odontocytes. So essentially uh, cells that are going to be similar to what we'd have with osteoblasts and osteocytes. They again are going to extend into the dentin structure in the same way that the osteoblasts and osteocytes are going to be involved with building and maintaining the bone cells, I mean sorry, the bone structure. So if we look in that, if we go deeper into the tooth, we've got the enamel around the outside, the dentin is like the, the bone-like uh, supporting structure. We're going to have the odontoblasts, which are going to be lining the pulp cavity, uh, the inside cavity uh, within the tooth. And they're going to be involved with secreting the organic matrix of the dentin. They're going to be involved with building the tooth, similar to the way uh, osteoblasts were involved with building the bone. Inside of that, Inside of that layer of odontoblasts, we'll have the pulp cavity. This is going to be a loose connective tissue that's very highly innervated and vascularized because this is going to be important for keeping those cells alive, keeping the odontoblasts alive so that they can maintain uh, the dentin within the tooth. And then underlying that, we're going to have the layer called cementum. Cementum is another bone-like layer um, that's covering uh, the dentin at the root of the teeth. And it essentially is going to be involved with helping to anchor uh, the teeth into the surrounding areas. If we take a look at tooth development, what we're going to see is something that's going to be very similar to what we saw with other types of epithelial specializations. And so we're going to have a tooth bud where we're looking at the oral epithelium, where it's essentially going to be proliferating and it's going to interact with the underlying connective tissue. And so we have the epithelial cells within the tooth bud interacting with the connective tissue cells within the dental papilla. And it's going to be the interaction of these two things that are going to come together and develop into the supporting structure, the developing structure of the tooth. 
And so what we're going to see is it's going to form a dental papillae at the center surrounded by an enamel organ. And so again, the cells within the dental papillae are going to differentiate into the odontoblast. The cells are going to produce the dentin as well as surrounding what will ultimately be the dental pulp, that central region, the core region of the tooth. The cells within the enamel organ are essentially going to differentiate and they're going to become enamel blasts. They're going to be involved with producing the enamel. And so they're going to essentially interact with the cells, the odontoblasts, so that the cells within the enamel organ stimulate the cells uh, within the dental papillae to become odontoblasts, to start to produce the dentin. And as they're producing the dentin, the bone-like structure within the tooth, that is going to uh, stimulate the ameloblast, the cells are going to be involved with uh, producing the enamel uh, to actually produce the enamel along the outside. So that's all we're going to say about the, the teeth. Again, the idea that they're going to be involved with grinding the food particles in this mechanical breakdown. The next structure we're going to look at is going to be the tongue. And the tongue is going to be important for essentially manipulating the food, rolling the food, and essentially uh, helping mix it as well as uh, the process of swallowing. We can take a look at the surface of the tongue. We're going to see that it has uh, essentially some projections associated with it. Uh, the first, the most numerous, are going to be filiform projections, and these are kind of spiky projections. Uh, they're going to be partly keratinized. They're going to give structure to uh, the, the surface of the tongue. Scattered in among the filiform papillae are going to be fungiform papillae, and the fungiform papillae are going to be extensions that are kind of shaped like mushrooms. And the important thing about this is that they're going to have scattered taste buds along their upper surface. So they're going to have essentially sensory receptors. They're going to allow for the discrimination of taste within the food particles that are being brought in uh, to the digestive system. The final type of papillae found within the tongue are going to be circumvillate uh, papillae. These are uh, larger circular papillae and they essentially are going to have a, a series of moats around this kind of enlarged region. And the taste buds are going to be very numerous along the sides within the moats. And this is going to be primarily where the taste is going to be occurring. If we look kind of anatomically deeper in the moats, at the base of the moats, we're going to see von Ebner's glands, which are going to be serum mucus, muco, I'm sorry, submucoso uh, mucus secreting glands, which are going to be releasing uh, products into uh, the oral cavity. They're going to help dissolve the food particles and essentially mix with these little shaped particles to allow them uh, to interact with the taste buds to allow for the sensation of taste. So if we take a look at the taste buds, either um, uh, in the locations we're looking at, what we're going to see is kind of like a little bulb-like organ. Uh, they're going to be much paler than the surrounding uh, minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelial cells and they're going to be specialized in that they're going to be able to bind to specific shapes of what you can think about as being taste molecules. And so the taste buds involved with sweet are going to be looking at hydroxyl groups, essentially the groups associated with sugars. Salty taste buds are going to be responding to metal ions such as sodium, uh, which are found in table salts. Uh, sour tastes are going to be uh, interacting with uh, the protons, such as the hydrogen ions associated with acids. Bitter tastes are going to be interacting with the alkaloids with a nitrogen base ring structure. And then the final taste, unami, is responding to glutamate, uh, such as found within monosodium glutamate uh, as a preservative for some foods, giving it kind of a, a rich taste. Uh, so it's going to be the mixture of these different types of molecules, these different types of uh, shapes of uh, ions, in essence, and, and groups, they're going to be contributing to the different tastes uh, within a variety of foods. Now, once the <clears throat> chemical breakdown has been occurring, I'm sorry, the, the mechanical breakdown has been occurring within the oral cavity, we're going to grind the food down into small uh, pieces. We'll talk about the saliva uh, when we talk about salivary glands at the end of this uh, series of lectures. But in essence, saliva is going to be mixed with it. We're going to be moistening the food. The tongue is going to roll it into a bolus of food, uh, a bolus of food that ultimately is going to be flipped to the back of the mouth, uh, to uh, the back of the pharynx, and essentially is going to go down into the esophagus. And so what we're going to have 
the esophagus is going to be a long, narrow, muscular tube, which is going to connect, in essence, the pharynx, the back of the mouth, with the stomach as uh, the first of our, our really organ structures involved with the processing of foods within the digestive system. In kind of a normal state, our esophagus is going to have a lot of luminal folds, uh, giving it kind of a scalloped appearance, because in most cases it's going to be kind of in its recoiled state, its kind of relaxed state. Uh, when food particles are going to be going through this, as you're swallowing something, the esophagus is going to be expanded as that food particle is passing down through it. Now, if we take a look at this, again, what we want is going to be able to protect our esophagus. And so we're going to be taking clumps of food and then swallowing them, and they're essentially going to be forced down through, uh, the, uh, through the esophagus as a tubular organ. It's going to be lined by a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And so it's going to have many cell layers thick, and then those surface cells are going to be uh, minimally keratinized. Some books say it's non-keratinized, but they're really minimally keratinized. This is an example of a wear and tear type epithelium. It's going to be subject to a lot of abrasion, and you want it to be, uh, in essence, a structure that can deal with the abrasion without damaging the epithelia. Because if you damage the epithelia, you increase the likelihood that we're going to end up with an infection. Underlying the mucosa, this minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, we're going to have esophageal glands, uh, many submucosal mucus secreting glands, which again are going to be coating the surface of the epithelium and lubricating it so that these food particles will be passing down through it uh, relatively easily. Outside of that, we're going to have uh, the muscularis externa, where we're going to have the muscle cells in the wall of this tube-like structure we take a look at it, in the upper third, we're going to have skeletal muscle, uh, so we can voluntarily uh, start that swallowing process. Uh, but the bottom third, we're going to have smooth muscle. So it's reflexively, continually moving those food particles that get down that far uh, are going to be pushed down into the stomach because we don't want food becoming lodged within the esophagus. So upper third, skeletal, under voluntary control. Lower third, smooth muscle, under reflexive control. That middle third is kind of a transition or kind of mixed as it's going from skeletal into smooth muscle. Now, if we take a look at the end of the esophagus, what we're going to see is one of the few very abrupt changes in epithelial type that we're going to see within the body. What we're going to see is going to be an abrupt change from the esophagus going into the stomach. And so when we take a look at it, we're going to go from a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelia, the lining of the esophagus, where we're going to be passing these food particles through it, into the stomach, where we're going to be involved more with the chemical processing and the breakdown of these food particles. And so we're going to go from a minimally keratinized stratified squamous epithelia of the esophagus, over in one on this diagram, onto a simple columnar epithelia when we go into the stomach. And again, we're going to be looking at this as a very different physiological need for that epithelial lining within the stomach than what we'd have in the transport structure within the esophagus. Okay, and this finishes up uh, our look at the oral cavity in the esophagus. In part three of this lecture series, we're going to take a look at the uh, the anatomy and physiology of the stomach. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.